Good evening. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We are glad that you are here. And I hope that you'll make some noise for Jeff and the worship band tonight. Amen? Amen. Jeff and Harmony, so grateful for both Jeff and Harmony and the band leading us in worship every single week. It's a blessing to be able to gather, to be together to worship as college students on Monday nights. We're thankful that you're here. Thank you for being a part of our service tonight. And and for being a part of the family, we really are glad that you're here. How many of you are celebrating Christmas yet? Amen? <laughs> Strong. The majority have begun Christmas. For everybody else, what are you waiting for? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. <laughs> I could read y'all's lips. Thanksgiving. All right. You're missing out. You're missing out. I woke up this morning singing Christmas music. It has started. Tyler, has it started for you? Not yet. <laughs> Wrong person to call on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love you. Hey, listen, we're glad that you're here tonight, and uh, I do want to say a word to uh, anybody who is your first time with us on a Monday night. Uh, we're grateful that you're here. Thank you so much. I know that many of you have met you already. It's your first time. Thank you for coming out and worshiping with us. We are a college ministry of Bellevue Baptist Church. Uh, we are not a church in and of itself. We are a college ministry that meets every Monday night for worship, and then we do in-home groups that are much smaller and even more intimate on Wednesday nights, uh, led by a lot of our students and also adult leaders. But we're glad that you're choosing to spend your Monday night with us. Uh, Bellevue members, aren't you grateful we got guests in the room as always? Amen? Amen, man. Appreciate y'all being here with us. Thank y'all for, for coming. I'm going to ask you to do something. If this is your first time, all I'm going to ask you to do is uh, we would love to get to know you. Right back there at the table, they're going to have their hands up in just a moment. We would love to meet you. And tonight, there's a couple ways you can get connected. So just for a moment, everybody look back at that table with me. Skylar's got her hands up. A lot of people looking back. I love it. Right there, boom. So let me tell you a little bit about that spot. So that back left corner has a lower table and a tall table. The lower table and the tall table are both going to have leaders behind them tonight. The lower table with the blue tablecloth is where you can come if you're a first-time guest and get connected more. You can meet me. I would love to meet you. Um, not that I'm special or anything, but I would love to meet you and get to know you. Um, at that table, we have a gift for you. We would love to encourage you. And then at the tall table that's closer to the door, uh, that's a table for our Wednesday night in-home life groups, which have been incredible this semester. I was talking to Zach a little bit ago about the vulnerability that has been happening in our groups. That's something we've prayed for uh, earnestly. We have prayed for vulnerability in these groups, and it's happening. So if you want to get connected to our in-home groups, um, a lot of them are in students' homes. They're Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. All you got to do is stop back by that table, and you'll get the address tonight. We'll give you the address. You'll be set up. You'll be good to go. As soon as you come in, somebody will encourage you. They'll welcome you in, and they'll introduce you to other people. Uh, what I ask of you is, as a college student, don't do the Christian life alone. Don't do the Christian life alone. As a college ministry, we exist to equip you in this season while also preparing you for what's next. Don't do the Christian life alone. We are continuing our series tonight, and I want to recap a little bit of where we have been. Now, this is the fourth week of our series. Week number one, we started with addressing our relationship with Christ. So before we got into dating, before we even scratched the surface of dating or talking about a relationship with a person, we talked about the need to have a healthy, growing maturing relationship with Jesus Christ. That basically what we found to be true is that every other relationship we have with people, the health of those relationships is always going to depend back on your health of your relationship with Christ. That that's how important it is. That not only the health of your soul, Kobe Drake, not only the health of your soul, not just Kobe Drake, but everybody, Connor, the health of your soul is going to be dependent on how connected you are to Jesus through prayer and Bible reading. But we also saw that every other relationship in our life, our parents, our roommates, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, and especially our girlfriends and our boyfriends or our fiancés, the health of those relationships is not more important than the health of your relationship with Christ because whatever you have with Jesus Christ is what you're going to be able to pour into your other relationships. That was week one. So we set the tone. We said, remember, if you are not in a place where you are maturing in your Bible reading and maturing in your prayer, you are not ready to date. And that was a hard statement, and some people didn't like it, and that's okay, but I stand by it. That if you are not actively pursuing a prayer life that's growing, not perfect, but growing, 
and Bible reading that's growing, then why are you trying to go start a relationship with another person? Tell me what the point of that is. And so uh, that was week one. For the last two weeks, we've talked about, Sam, what the Bible says about a godly man. And last week, we, we did an interview panel where we talked about what the Bible says about a godly woman. Well, we still have three more weeks, <clears throat> and tonight I'm excited for what we're going to talk about. I want to go ahead and give you my title. You've probably seen it on social media. The title of my sermon tonight is, Let's Talk About Sex. And we move into one of the most important sermons, not just in this series, but one of the most important sermons I think <clears throat> we're going to do at The View. It's very, very needed to talk about. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and open with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Amen? Yeah, amen. And also make a mark for Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> so you can turn to Ephesians chapter 5, but I would love for you to turn also to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to jump all over tonight, Scripture, looking at different places where Scripture speaks into this. Now, my first semester on staff with The View <clears throat> my first semester on staff was the fall of 2016. Yeah, that's crazy, right? Some of y'all, I don't know, y'all, some of y'all were in high school in 2016. Some of y'all may be in middle school. Is anybody in middle school in 2016? I don't need to know. Never mind. Don't worry. I don't need to know. I don't need to know that, man. Let's not talk about that. I came on staff as a intern, as an M we weren't MAs at the time, we were just interns, <laughs> a lot less flashy and, and didn't have as many resources at the time. I came on as an intern. And what I did is I worked uh, 29 hours as an intern for the college ministry, and I was a college student. So I ministered to my peers. Uh, the challenges that came with that were through the roof. When you're ministering to people your age, and for me, I had just gotten saved eight months earlier. So ministering to people who largely have more Bible knowledge than I do was challenging. But I was able to really equip and push a lot of college students to live out their faith. To not just have it here, but to have knowledge of the word that pushes you to actually live it out. How many of you know that Bible knowledge without action is not leading you to anything productive? Amen. God wants us to know him, not just to know him, but so that we can go and live like him and help others know him too. <clears throat> and so for me, my first semester on staff, the guy that hired me, his name was Montana Jones. And he did mine and Hannah's wedding, and we had an amazing time working together. It was a very short stint. None of you would really know him, but we worked together in the college ministry, and he prayed for you, even though you don't know that. He prayed for you. He prayed for the view today. So you have pastors that were here long before me that prayed for y'all, this generation at University of Memphis, and now we're seeing some of the fruit of it. He prayed for you guys. And I remember that first semester, he told me. We were in a staff meeting. I was still trying to figure out what to do in staff meetings because I'd never been in a staff meeting before. And we were in a staff meeting. He said, Daniel, I think I'm going to do a sermon series. I said, all right, sounds good. What are we going to call it? He's like, Daniel, I'm going to call it God and Sex. <laughs> and I remember being a new believer for about eight months. I stared at him. This is exactly what I said. I said, Montana, I don't think those go together. <laughs> and I literally told him, I said, Montana, are you really going to preach not just a sermon, but multiple sermons on God and sex? And I love his response. He's very stone cold. He looked at me. He said, Yep. <laughs> Yep. See, what I was under was a misconception about God and sex. I had come to a place in my life where I believed the lie that God is against sex. So the very idea of God and sex being in the same category, the, even the idea of talking about sex within the church walls was shocking to me because I never thought that you would actually go there. And I'll tell you this. <clears throat> All I had heard my entire life was don't have sex. Don't have sex. Wait till marriage. That's all I knew was don't have sex. Don't have sex. Wait till marriage. Wait till marriage. Don't have sex. And all I had was beating over the head of why not to do it. But I want you to understand something. I had never heard why. I had never in my life heard why I was supposed to wait for marriage to have sex. I had never actually known why. And if I had heard it, it never went to my heart in any kind of capacity. And I'll tell you, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of college students in here who had their entire lives, all they have heard is just don't do it. Just don't do it. Just wait. Just wait. It's God's plan. Well, I want you to understand something, and I believe that this will be on the screen. I would love for you to write this down. When you don't understand God's why, you'll end up accepting Satan's lies. When you don't understand God's why, you'll always end up accepting lies. See, I learned in college that God is not against sex because sex was his idea. <laughs> God is against the distortion of sex. 
which is what we do in our culture today. So let's acknowledge what we need to acknowledge. Talking about sex, especially in the church, is uncomfortable. Can we admit that? It is. It's an uncomfortable thing. My question for you is why? Why is it uncomfortable when we talk about sex in the church? Because everywhere we go, we see sex everywhere. Movies, books, TV shows, our college campus, all the media that we intake. Everywhere we go, sex is displayed everywhere. But when it comes to the church, there's this tense, there's this nervous, there's this anxious feeling when it comes to sex in the church. Sex is literally everywhere to us, and it's normal. Here's why. I want you to understand what's happened to our culture. The reason why is because of sin, shame, and a lack of understanding of God's design for it. Sin, shame, and a lack of understanding God's design for it. Many of us in this room have sexual sin in our past or in our present, and it brings shame to us. So the thought of your college pastor preaching on sex is not a good thought to you, and you thought about skipping tonight, let's be honest. (laughs) Let's be real. That's not a good thought to you because you have stuff in your past and you have stuff in your present when it comes to sexual sin that makes it uncomfortable to talk about in the church. What's happened is you and I have subconsciously, hear me out for a minute, and we're just going to talk about this tonight. You and I have subconsciously connected sex and church to shame and guilt. It's going to be heavy tonight, but I believe it's necessary. We've connected shame and guilt to sex and church. So whenever church and sex come together, we immediately react with with shame and guilt because we've never understood the value of why God's plan is is God's plan. And so my prayer tonight is that you understand shame and guilt is not God's will for you, but repentance and restoration is God's will for you. Shame and guilt are not a part of the plan, but repentance and restoration are a part of the plan. I believe there's students in here tonight who are living in shame and guilt, and God is calling you out of that because that's of the enemy. I also believe, though, there's many college students in here who are, if they were going to be honest tonight, and we're going to talk about some hard things, but we need to be honest, living in that sexual sin And you're remorseful about it, but you're not really repentful about it. I've prayed for you. I've done a lot of studying and a lot of reading and a lot of praying over tonight. I've prayed for you that you would experience freedom tonight. When the church or when a college ministry preaches on sex, the goal is not guilt and shame. The goal is heavenly understanding, which is my other reason for why it's uncomfortable to talk about it in the church. We lack understanding. We don't understand why. In fact, the number of college students who are having sex before marriage is through the roof. I'll tell you this statistic. I'm not sure if it'll be on the screen or not. Yes, it will. Look at this. A recent survey found that 57% of Christians believed that casual sex between unmarried people is perfectly acceptable. That's over half the room. That casual sex with unmarried people is perfectly acceptable. This is what I wrote in my notes. So... I literally wrote S O O O O O. I like that. So, coming out of that statistic, what are our options? Here's our options, PJ. We can A, never preach about it and act like it doesn't exist and stay comfortable in here. We can B, scream, just say no to sexual sin. Just try harder, you know? And nothing ever happened because willpower won't do it. Willpower will never work. Or, We can preach the truth and glory of God's design for sex, begin to understand it, and begin to pray it back to God. So tonight what I've chosen to do is I'm going to preach the truth about the glory of the design of sex that God has given, and I'm going to pray. We're going to pray tonight over it. And so I want you to turn your attention with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 33. An amazing text that Paul has written to the Ephesians. We've used this in this series before. This is not a new text. In fact, we'll be coming back to this text in two weeks when we talk about marriage. This will be a text you'll be very familiar with. It starts off with Paul exhorting us today and the Ephesians in his time. An amazing application for us today, exhorting the Ephesians to be imitators of God, to walk in love. Now you think about that for a moment. Chapter 5 begins with Paul saying, hey, imitate God, that what you are most called to do is to imitate God, to look at Jesus and say, hey, whatever he does, I do. What he doesn't do, I don't do. We're called to imitate God and to walk in love. And he goes throughout this chapter where he breaks down light versus darkness. He comes to wives and to husbands, and that's not the conversation for tonight. But he gets to the end of it, and he says this, starting in verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, we're going to continue with verse 32, but I want to stop on verse 31. I want to remind you, next week is a Q&A on sex, dating, and marriage, where we're going to cover a lot of topics. But I do want to make it very clear in here for the room. And when I say this, this is not out of a place of hate. 
This is the last thing that this, that this is coming from is a place of hate. It's not, but our culture wants you to believe that it's hateful. But I want to tell you, God's design for marriage is one man and one woman. And I cannot sacrifice truth of what scripture says to tell you that it's any other way. Marriage is not one man and one man. It's not one woman and one woman. And now this is not Daniel's opinion. This is not that trough's opinion, all right? This is what scripture says. Scripture says marriage, and this is not tonight's sermon, but I do want to make this clear to everybody in the room as to what we believe, and that's the Bible. Not any man's opinion, but scripture, truth. And that's that marriage, in God's eyes, is one man and one woman. And that's what marriage is. And Paul, all through Scripture, makes that clear. Now, if you want to ask questions about that, next week is a Q&A and all these things. Send those questions in. I would love, I'm going to try to answer as many as I can. But let's continue going tonight. Verse 32. This mystery, and if you underline in your Bible, I'd love for you to underline mystery. I love that. Uh, this mystery is profound. But I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, I love that Paul, man. To sum up, like, in other words, let me put it all together for you in one sentence. Each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Not only that, but I want to go back to Genesis 128 before we pray. And Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, the creation account says this. God blessed them. This is after creating man and woman in his image. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on earth. Let's pray tonight. <clears throat> Father, we love you. And Lord, I know that there are so many people in here who have been affected by sexual sin. Uh, God, I pray tonight that your spirit would have every word. Lord, I pray that your truth would not be sacrificed in any way. I pray that you would give me every word to say tonight. Lord, I pray that my posture would be one of love. Lord, I pray that our posture with each other would be one of love. Father, I do pray that tonight you would use this to, to enhance our view of our bodies and of sex and of your design. God, that we would walk away from this not thinking higher of sex. Maybe, God, as a byproduct of thinking higher of Jesus. Father, I pray that we would walk away glorifying Jesus and out of that would come a higher view of our bodies and your, good, your design and your plan, God. I pray for anyone in here who doesn't know you that they would give their lives to you tonight, that they would not turn to anything else for salvation except the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for strongholds in here tonight to be broken. Father, I pray you would rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, by the word of God, and by the spirit of God from this place. He has no hold here. He is a loser. I pray against any spirit of fear or discouragement. I pray that you would send that spirit wherever Jesus would send it. Lord, I pray that in this room would be freedom. I pray that in this room would be power. I pray that in this room would be joy. God, conviction and encouragement in this room and that we would walk out of here knowing what we are supposed to do. Father, we love you. And I thank you so much for letting me be with these incredible people tonight. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So here's what I want to do. I would love for you to write this down. The main question for tonight is this. What's a myth and what's the truth when it comes to sex? <clears throat> what's a myth and what's a truth when it comes to sex? I'm going to give you two myths. It's hard to say with an S on it. Two myths, a myth and another myth. And then I'm going to give you two truths when it comes to sex. Two myths that our culture believes, that you see all over TikTok, that you see all over Instagram, that you see everywhere but also two truths from the Bible when it comes to sex. And whatever we are unable to cover tonight, I'm really praying to cover next week in our Q&A. <clears throat> but what is a myth and what is truth when it comes to sex? First off, we have to understand where in the world we went wrong. Now, in the Garden of Eden, hear me for a minute. In the Garden of Eden, Satan exposed his strategy. I love what Robbie Gallaty said recently. He said that Satan is... God bless you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'm glad everybody's okay. <laughs> now, it's hard to recover from that, man. In the garden. <laughs> That's such a hard transition, man. Oh, I need to keep going, Dawson. I'm on the clock. In the garden, Satan exposes his tragedy. Now, I love what Robbie Gallaty said. I love our pastor, Brother Steve, and I love Pastor Robbie Gallaty out of Nashville. I love what Robbie said recently. He said that Satan is crafty, but he's not creative. 
Satan is crafty, but he's not creative. And here's why. And, and some of this I'm going to give you is specifically from Robbie Gallaty's study. I wish I could take credit for some of this, but this is good stuff, and I wanted to lay it as a foundation for temptation. Satan is crafty. He's not creative. In other words, he exposed his strategy in the garden. He exposed his strategy with Jesus in the desert, and he exposes his strategy with you. His strategy has been the same since the beginning. So if you want to know how the enemy is coming after you with temptations, it's one of three things. And I'm going to give you these right now. Satan's three temptations are, the first one is appetite. <laughs> I experience this when Dakota wants to go to Huey's every day. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Got to be getting sick of it. <laughs> appetite. The second one is ambition. Ambition. And the third one is approval. Now, these are three temptations Satan uses. Let's expose them in Luke chapter 4. Let's look at these. And this is going to pertain heavily to what we're talking about tonight. Luke chapter 4 says this. Then Jesus left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. Now, he ate nothing during those days. And when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Tempting his appetite. But Jesus answered him. It is written, man must not live on bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. I'll tell you this about the devil. He's a loser, but he also has some nerve. <laughs> to come to the king of kings and act like he has a king to give to the king is foolish enough. <laughs> the devil has no king to, uh, kingdom to offer Jesus Christ. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? And Satan is a loser. He comes to him. He offers him the world. If you then, verse 7, if you then will worship me, all will be yours. I'll tell you, there's many in our culture today who will not come out and say this. There are some, there are Satanists that worship Satan, but there are many who worship the world and what they can gain. And they're falling into the temptation of ambition because it will never satisfy you. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll come back to that. Verse 8. And Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. And now Satan uses scripture. He tries to misquote it. For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Aren't you grateful that Jesus said no to every temptation of this world? Hallelujah. Aren't you grateful for that, man? I tell you, he said no to every temptation. He said no to every sin. You think about how, and I'm not trying to, I'm not guilting you or shaming you. I just want to use some logic. Think about how often we sin. Man, anger, impatience, like it's often. Think about Jesus never giving in to sin because he's the perfect savior, the son of God, fully man, fully God, no to every temptation. That's glorious, Sean. It's amazing. Now let's talk appetite. When the enemy tempts your appetite, he's tempting you to meet a good need in a bad way. He's tempting you to meet a good need in a bad way. See, eating food is a good need, but gluttony is a sin. Sex is a good thing. Casual sex before marriage is a sinful way to meet it. What you have to understand about your flesh and my flesh, because we're all in the same boat. None of us are more holier than now. Every single one of us still have flesh, which means our flesh is desperate. It has an appetite for sin. Hear me for a moment. Your flesh has an appetite for sin. Your flesh will crave sin. And when you are not full of the Spirit, when you're not walking in God's Word, when you're not in prayer, your flesh is going to choose that sin very often. Paul speaks about it all through Romans. He tempts you to meet good needs in a bad way. That's why every day we have to wake up and die to our flesh. I love Galatians 5, verse 24. It says, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We die to our flesh. We die to our appetite. It's crazy to even think about how Israel was so desperate for God to provide water. Because for us, when we get thirsty, we walk to the fridge and grab us a water bottle. Robbie Galley said one thing in, this, in his sermon that I thought was so good. He said, he said I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to leave it and I've got to move on. He said, convenience will often ruin dependence. I was like, man, that's a word, brother. Like, I wish I could take credit for that. Convenience will ruin dependence. In other words, when you have Dasani water bottles everywhere, why pray for water? And I'm not saying, I love having a refrigerator as much as anybody. 
Sugar cookies are good cold. I don't know if you knew that or not. But convenience ruins dependence. We have everything we need so quickly. And praise God we do, but we often don't pray desperately because we have what we need. But then comes ambition. I have known those who have fallen into sin and sexual sin because of the ambition for the high. The ambition. I want to give you a line that I'd love for you to write down. Sexual sin never satisfies. It only brings the need for a higher high. You have to understand that tonight. Sexual sin never satisfies. It only brings the need for a higher high. And you know this pornography, which is something that both men and women struggle with. That is not a man-only struggle. Pornography never satisfies. It only brings the need for a higher high. A higher high. And you continue. Your whole life will chase that high instead of experiencing the intimacy that Christ wants for you. Never satisfies. But then lastly, approval. Approval. Satan knows that sin is enticing because it offers us false approval. Quick approval. And he tempts you with that. In fact, Jesus spoke about this. In regards to the Pharisees, when he said this right here, John 12, 43, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. So when it comes to how we are viewed by others, approval is a big idol in our culture. I think it's a bigger idol than we even want to admit. We don't make statues and put them in the yard of other people and worship and bow down to them, but what we do is we worship the validation and the affirmation that comes from other people. As a pastor, if I idolize what you think about me or need validation from you, I gotta tell you, I'm not gonna be in ministry very long. And that's something I learned a year in, that if I have to, if my success as a pastor is dependent on what you think about me, I won't last very long. And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter if you're an engineer or in ministry or go across the seas, whatever, across uh, uh, the nations, whatever you do, I hear me. If your value and worth is wrapped up in people's opinions of you, you're not going to last very long. It's tiring, it's exhausting. And when it comes to sexual sin, I want you to understand there are many even in here, who give in to sexual sin because they want the approval of that person. Men and women are both willing to give sexual sin just to be approved by another person, just to feel the validation. And we find ourselves in a slippery, slippery slope. Satan is crafty, but he's not creative. The same three temptations have been around forever. Because we chose sin in the garden, that is why today we live in a hyper-sexualized culture. We live in a hyper-sexualized culture. In fact, the Eternals, it's amazing, Marvel's first, and I'm not against Marvel or anything. I'm not coming out at that. I like superheroes, man, but I'm just telling you, the Eternals, the first Marvel movie to have a sex scene in it, and it's celebrated, and it's praised, and it's, it's awesome that we're showcasing this, but I just want to tell you, that shows what our culture celebrates. Don't hear me. Daniel's against the Eternals. I'm not, but you see what our culture celebrates? You see what our culture celebrates. So let me give you two myths. Here's the first one. I want you to write this down. Myth number one is this, that sex is casual. It's not that big of a deal. A myth that a lot of us believe in here is that sex is casual. It's not that big of a deal. In my studying, I came across this story that I thought was fantastic. It was a book that Grace recommended to me, and I thought it was very good. Hear me for a minute on this because I, I, I love this. I think that this is so good. A pastor was talking to one of his friends that isn't a Christian. His friend was choosing to have sex, hear me out for a minute, with many women, engaging in sex with many women. And the pastor asked his friend, he asked him this question. He said, does sex mean anything to you? He asked him that, Bree. He asked his friend who was having sex with many women, he said, does sex mean anything to you? Here's what his friend said. His friend laughed and said, nah, Man, it's just for fun. It's just for pleasure. And then he bragged about the number of women that he had slept with. So the next time, the pastor lets it go. They see each other again. The next time, the pastor asks him a different question. He asked him this. Hear this for a minute. He said, do you believe a pat on the back means anything? Think about that. I've given Dakota thousands of pats on the back over, over the years. Just whenever he do a layup right, I give him a pat on the back. I've given Sean a pat on the back after I beat him one-on-one in basketball. Man, a pat on the back. Does a pat on the back... Don't shake your head. It happened. Don't shake your head, man. Come on now. Does a pat on the back mean anything? This is what his friend said. Watch this. His friend said, yes, it communicates support. Okay. Pastor said, all right. What about a kiss on the cheek? What's that communicate? His friend said, shows care and affection. 
okay. Lastly, the pastor said, what about a slap in the face? So if I come up and just, boom, slap you in the face as hard as I can, what's that mean? His friend said, well, that's an insult. Pastor shook his head. Here's what he said, I'll put it on the screen. He said, if a kiss on the cheek, slap on the face, and a pat on the back have real meaning, how can the act of sex, which involves the deepest physical intimacy between people, not mean anything beyond itself? And that's crazy, but it's what we believe. It's exactly what we believe. His friend stared at him, and he said, you have a point. (laughs) That's what we believe in our culture. We believe that sex is casual. It's not that big of a deal. Yet we admit how much is involved with a shake of the hand or a fist bump or a hug or a kiss on the cheek or a punch. We know what those communicate, so how much more does sex communicate between two people? I just want to ask you the right questions. If I come up to you and I say, what's up, Trey? Good to see you, man. My dog. Come on. If that communicates love and support, what does sex communicate? Does it communicate anything? If you're not a believer in here, I'm glad you're here. I would love to talk to you, but I want to ask you, does sex communicate anything or is it just pleasure? Is it just an exchange of goods? Because our culture loves to believe that it's just an exchange of goods. It's just about your pleasure and it doesn't communicate anything. I want to argue that. One of the greatest lies our culture believes is this. We believe that you can separate the body and the soul, meaning what you do with your body does not impact your soul, and that's one of the greatest lies from hell. That is a lie straight out of the pit of hell, that you can separate your body and soul and that what you do with your body does not impact your soul. I'll tell you, that is a lie. Bodily actions carry real meaning. Sid, I got to tell you, bodily actions carry real meaning. One thing I wrote down is sex is not casual because it carries huge meaning to it. And Jesus understood the meaning of touch. Because when the leper, who nobody else touched, the man that came with leprosy that needed healing, Jesus touched him. And he didn't have to touch him to heal him. You realize that, right? Jesus didn't have to make physical contact to heal the leper. But he did anyway because he showed the value of physical touch. And what was being communicated in that moment, I would even dare say that Jesus touching him was just as impactful as the actual healing itself because it communicated something about Jesus and about his relationship. I wrote this down. We communicate with our bodies and our words because God has made us both body and soul. This is why we communicate both ways. It's amazing when you think about it. It's not rocket science. It's simple, but our culture loves to twist it. It's a mistake to downplay the value of your body. I want to tell you, your body, in God's eyes, has the utmost value, but your body in the world's eyes doesn't have that much value. Did you know that? It's true. You say, Daniel, that's not true. I'll bet you. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, Paul is also, which we've been in 1 Corinthians, he speaks about it right here. He says, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple, that the Spirit of God lives in you? That if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. One of my favorite things, and Hannah spoke about it last week with women, the value Christianity places upon women. One of my favorite things about Christianity and God's word is the value it places on your body and on my body. I love it because it's truth. And I'll tell you this, in my studying, this has been around for a while. There's a shift that happened. 1859, Charles Darwin came out with the theory of evolution. Hear me out for a minute. Stay with me. I'm telling you. In 1859, a shift began. When Charles Darwin came out, Deco, with his theory of evolution, what happened is a shift began to happen in the culture. Watch this. It's fascinating. What was popular, what began to be popular is what we see today. There was a separation from body and soul, a separation between the human body and a human person. And that ended up killing the value of the body in our eyes even today. Because if the body is separate from the person, then what you do with your body sexually, hear me, has no connection as to who you are as a person. And that's simply not true. What you do with your body sexually is connected to who you are as a person. Sex can be purely physical, and when you believe that, when you believe the body and the soul are separate, then sex has nothing to do with love. And every single person in here would say, that's not true. Sex involves love. The question is, to what degree? What does it communicate in God's eyes? So our over-sexualized culture today encourages people to do whatever they want with their bodies, and it's camouflage. It's camouflage like it's placing value on your body because it's giving you freedom to do whatever you want with it. But I want to tell you, freedom is not you doing whatever you want with your body. Freedom is understanding what God has called you to do with your body and why he gave it to you in the first place. 
That's freedom. You can't tell me that pornography does not affect your heart and your mind. I'm not beating you over head tonight. I'm talking to you logically. You can't tell me pornography does not affect your heart and your mind. You cannot tell me that casual sex does not affect the way you love and the way you treat people. You can't tell me it. If you can, I will talk to you for a long time because God's word says different. I'll tell you this. Did you know that pornography sites, as of a few years ago, now receive more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined? Did you know that young girls are being pushed to be sexually active but detach their feelings as best as they can? I'll give you an example. Cosmos Magazine advises women that the way to wow a man after sex, hear me, ladies, this is what the magazines are pushing you to do. The way to wow a man after sex is to ask for a ride home after. Implying, <clears throat> implying, I get fired up about it, I'll tell you what, implying that. You can wow a man by detaching the love and the feelings that go along with sex completely. And hey, that was just an exchange of goods. Can you give me a ride home? That's our culture. That's where we are. That's the reality of it. I'll tell you this. There's a children's television workshop that defines sex to kids as something done by two adults to give pleasure. Is pleasure involved? Absolutely. But I'll tell you this. That definition is an exchange of two goods. It's an exchange. It's not love. There was no mention of love to children, no mention of love, no mention of marriage, no mention of value, an exchange of goods for pleasure. What happens is love and marriage are completely left out of it. Guys, this is crazy, but this is what we live in. So I want to tell you truth number one. Sex represents unity and intimacy. Sex represents unity and intimacy. Hear me. Pleasure is involved, and thank goodness. But I'll tell you this. Pleasure is not the end game. It is intimacy, and it is unity. When you look back at Ephesians 5, 31 to 33, it says that I am talking about Christ and the church. This mystery is profound. Sexuality is a part of the whole person. I'll put this on the screen. I believe this will be up there. The purpose of sex is to express the one flesh covenant bond excuse me, of marriage and love. So college students, think about this. God created you as one unified being, your body and your soul together, so please stop letting the culture devalue your body or your soul. Please stop allowing, and I'm in the same boat with you, man, stop buying the lie that your body does not have value, that you could just do whatever you want with it and you're fine. That's not true. I'll tell you this, Lecrae said in his book, and his book on his story, one of the things he said that was in another book that I was reading really stood out to me. I love this. This is just a quote from him. He said that the first time he went to a Christian conference, hear this for a moment. The first time he went to a Christian conference, the speaker said our bodies were valuable. And he said, I had never connected spirituality and sexuality before. He said, I had never had someone tell me how valuable I am and how valuable my body is. See, God's design for sex is beautiful when you realize that when a couple has sex, they enter into, hear this, a deeper unity. That they enter into a unity, a bond. And what's amazing is this unity is not just spiritual, it's emotional, it's relational, and it's even biochemical. Do you know how much is involved when it comes to sex? Do you know? Do you know? For some of us, we're so quick to talk about sex and want to engage in sex, but we don't know very little about it. All we know about is what we've seen from pornography. That's a very false depiction of what sex actually is or the purpose of it. Do you know what's involved when you're looking at something on your phone and you engage in sin? Do you know what's involved? Because it's on a biochemical level. It's incredible, I'm telling you. Which is why, you want to know why it's difficult for teenagers to break up after they engage in sex? It's because of that. There's a biochemical connection that happens and it's harder for them to detach from each other because they have done something with each other that was meant for marriage. It's amazing. I wish when I was in college somebody would have given me this. I wish somebody would have given me this, man. God's design for sex is that it helps a husband and wife bond together for life. It represents intimacy. It represents passion. And thank God that sex did not uh, come out boring. <laughs> thank goodness that God didn't make sex boring. I want to say he made it exhilarating. He made it fun because it's a gift. What you never hear in our culture is how sex is a gift. You never hear about how it's valuable. But I'll tell you this, your heart, 
when you truly understand the value of sex, how you look at your boyfriend or your girlfriend will shift. All of a sudden, it's not just about pleasure. It's about God's plan. It's about God's design. All of a sudden, your heart towards pornography will shift when you really understand God's plan for it, that there's intimacy and unity involved. But even more significant than that, I wrote this down, God has designed sex. And I want you to think about this for a moment because I've never heard it this clearly in my life. God has designed sex as a way for us to bring another life into this world. You think about that for a moment. I was reading something about can humans create and a class was like, no, they can't create. We just edit things. And that's true to a big degree. But I'll tell you this, humans create life through sex, through God, that your actions have the power to bring another human being into this life. Is that not amazing? I'll tell you what, it's unreal. So as a college student, I want to tell you this, if you're seeking to do it God's way, If you're seeking to remain pure, if you're seeking to keep sex for your future marriage, accountability is not enough. It's important. I want to tell you this, boundaries are not enough. It's important. But hear me, and I'll say this as clearly as I can. In order to do it God's way, you have to understand God's way. And once you understand God's way, you'll begin to value God's way. For years we've been told, just don't do it. Be tough. Toughen up. Be strong. It's good, but it's not going to help you. Accountability will, boundaries will. But I'll tell you this. Until you value sex, until you value the love and the intimacy of sex and how it's meant for marriage, those boundaries will fail. And you'll keep on lying to that accountability partner. And when it comes to your boundaries, you'll keep on crossing that line. You'll keep on crossing that line. God has designed marriage for amazing. But I want to give you another myth. And I know that in this room this is tense, but it needs to be said. Myth number two, as long as we don't have sex, we can do everything else. When was the last time you heard that preached on? Let's put that back up on the screen for me if we can. As long as we don't have sex, we can do everything else. What I'm about to tell you in a moment is one of the most important things I'm going to say this semester. James 1, verses 14 to 15, my D group knows this, Matt Long knows this, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire, that after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Not only that, but 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 5, for this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles do, look at this last phrase, who don't no, God. If we're going to be honest tonight, I mean really honest for a moment, I'll tell you where a lot of college students are, and it's one of the toughest battles. What we do is, if we're going to be honest, as Christians, I'm speaking to a lot of Christians in the room right now, when it comes to dating, we get as close to having sex as we can without having sex. We push the boundary, we push the line, we do everything but sex. And that's our goal. And I want you to understand, the reason why this is the case, what I'm about to say to you, could not be a truer statement about our generation today. Why this happens, why we cross those lines when we're in a car, when we're home alone, why we go as far as we can without having sex is because of this. Christians are pursuing virginity, but they're not pursuing purity. What I just said is one of the most important statements I have made at The View as the college pastor. Because tonight somebody is coming out of sexual sin. Tonight somebody is breaking through of sexual temptation. Tonight somebody is breaking through. What we have is we have Christians that don't pursue purity because they're pursuing virginity. But God bless you. So what we have is we have a lot of Christians who don't have sex itself, but they do all the sexual acts leading up to sex, and they feel all right about it. First, let me say sexual sin is sexual sin. Let, we got we to gotta call it what it is. Doesn't matter how far that line is. Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed sin. It does not matter if you are not engaging in the act of sex itself. The acts leading up to sex are damaging, they're hurtful, and they're sin. If they're done outside of the context of marriage. But a lot of college students stay in that place for so long. I've seen so many, I'm telling you, I've seen so many college students just stuck in that place, stuck in that rut, and they can't get out of this trap. 
They had them in a place where, hey, we're dating, we're not having sex, but we're doing everything else we can, and we really don't know how to get out of it. And to be honest, we really don't know if we want to get out of it. And here's what I want to tell you. We end up in this place because the goal of the relationship, what we have deemed as success, and hear me for a moment, what we have deemed as success is just holding on to being a virgin, but we're not actively pursuing purity. So here's the deal. When it comes to being in the car alone, when it comes to being in the, in the rooms alone, when it comes to these environments, you are never going to truly make an act to get out of those environments where you fall until you begin to address that that sexual sin is sin. You won't do it. You're going to continue to stay in that place. You're going to continue to stay in a parked car. You're going to continue to hang out with the door closed in a room. You're going to continue to do the same thing. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. When evil desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. I'm telling you, if you are not willing to change those environments, you're never going to get out of that sin. And here's what I want to tell you. Unless your perspective changes from just, hey, as long as we make it to marriage and I'm a virgin, then everything else is fine. Until, hey, the goal of this dating relationship is purity. It's honoring God with our bodies. And that includes our, everything from our mind to sex itself and everything in between. Until that's your goal is purity, you're not going to make an action. But here's what's amazing. When you begin to say the goal of this relationship is to honor God with our thoughts, our minds, our actions, and our body. What you'll do then is you'll start to make actions. You'll stop being in the car alone. So here's what I'll tell you. For couples who constantly engage in sexual sin in the car, the acts leading up to sex but not sex itself, and they claim that it's sin and want out of it, if you're not willing to change that environment, you don't want out of it. If you won't change that environment, ladies, if he won't stop taking you to a closed door room, he doesn't want out of it. Fellas, if she won't stop talking to you lustfully, she doesn't really want out of sin. I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight, but I'm preaching to somebody. I'm telling you, until you realize it's about purity and it's about value, you're never going to make a play on that temptation. So that's why tonight, the greatest thing that you can hear is not sex is bad. Sex is not bad. It's God's idea. He designed it. He gave it to you as a gift. But hear this. Sex is special. It involves the biggest act of love. It communicates love. And when it's done within God's plan, it's the most beautiful thing that you can ever have. But... When you do it outside of God's plan, it brings hurt, it brings pain, it brings chaos, and it brings confusion. It brings a momentary fleshly pleasure that never lasts, and you'll continue to chase that higher high. You can't just hate the idea of giving in to sin. What you do is you fall in love with the design and the value of sex and how God has created it. And when you fall in love with God's plan and God's design and who he is, you'll start finding victory you'll start finding victory. Remember, if you don't know God's why, you'll always end up purchasing Satan's lies. Make a play. Make an action. Get in prayer. Realize what you need to do. And for anyone in here who has sexual sin in their past, I want you to understand something because I know that there are those or something you're struggling with now that you've repented of. I want to let you know you do not have any less value in God's eyes. You are loved. You are loved. And for anybody in here who has repented of sexual sin, I want to tell you one of the greatest verses you'll ever find in Scripture. It's 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. Aren't you grateful for that tonight? Amen. Amen. What does it look like for you in your singleness to pursue real purity of thought, of word, of action? What does that look like for you this week? For those of you who are dating, what does it look like to not just say, oh, we're going to keep these boundaries up, we're going to do, do better. What does it look like for you to prayerfully pursue purity and God's plan for you? What does that look like for you? I'll tell you this, it looks like talking to somebody who's older than you that you trust and letting them pour into your life. I've talked to many people who never got out of sexual sin because they never told anybody. They just never told anybody. If they would have told one person, they probably would have got out of it. Some of you in here, and you've never, you haven't told the person you're accountable to. You haven't told anybody that temptation. You haven't told anybody what you're looking at on your phone. But once you do and once you pray, you start finding freedom, I'm telling you. And that's why I want to give you truth number two. And I hope that you write this down. Truth number two, sex and marriage reveal a mystery. And I love this about Ephesians chapter 5. 
I love this about Ephesians chapter 5. And I cannot wait for the conversations on Wednesday night in our in-home life groups, girl only, guy only. I cannot wait for the conversations that come out of this sermon. I'm telling you, if you want to talk deeper, if you want to discuss deeper, come Wednesday night to our life groups. We would love to have you there. We're going to talk about all this stuff in detail with the opposite sex out of the room. But truth number two is this. Sex and marriage reveal a mystery. Paul says it. He says the mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Hear me for a moment. Paul is saying that marriage has existed since creation to the point to point us to the mysterious union between Christ and the church, us and you. The Bible even begins with a wedding between Adam and Eve and human history. If you think about this, Nathaniel, human history is leading up to Christ and the church coming together as one. It's leading up to a marriage, which is what's so incredible. Paul is saying that there is a mystery that's communicated. And I love what Sean McDowell, one of the authors I've been reading on this, he says. He says, our obsession with sex today misses its deeper purpose of foreshadowing our union with God in heaven. He makes the argument that sex and marriage foreshadow heaven. That that's the degree to which there's value on sex and marriage. That it is foreshadowing the union that's to come in heaven. Dawson, that's incredible. That's amazing. But we don't understand that. We never take the time to really understand how, how, that's why the divorce rate's so high. And we're coming up on marriage. I got a little bit of time here, but I just want to tell you, that's, why the, that's the reason why divorce rate is so high, even amongst Christians. Because we miss that it's pointing us to the greater union that's to come between Christ and the church. We misunderstand the value of it. And I'll tell you this, I'll even add to it. Our obsession with escaping singleness and getting married has caused us to miss the deeper purpose of marriage itself. If singleness is a gift, If marriage is a gift, if sex is a gift, all gifts are meant to point you back to the gift giver. I'll take it one step further. Whenever you obsess over the gift, but you miss the giver, you miss the purpose of the gift. Twenty, twenty-one years old, I wish somebody would have taught me what it looks like that sex and marriage is a gift from God and it's meant to point me back to the giver but we so in our culture today miss why these exist the greatest marriage on earth let's say you get married one day if that's God's calling for you let's say you get married one day and you've got a pretty good house and you got some kids and man you got a a, a job you love and you're sharing Jesus at your job you're making disciples at your job you eat good food every night You watch sports together, fellas, she likes watching sports with you. Ladies, he likes cooking with you. He likes hanging out with you, spending time with you. Y'all go to putt-putt together. Y'all date each other. Y'all do each other's hobbies. Y'all spend time together. You love each other, and you love your kids, and your kids grow up. They get saved. They become believers. They go on to share Jesus and make disciples, and you do it God's way. I want to tell you, even if the greatest marriage on earth is still just a small foreshadowing of the heavenly marriage that's to come, The heavenly marriage is to come. Even the most wonderful marriage, the most wonderful sex life cannot satisfy the craving your soul has for love. Only Jesus can meet that need. Only Jesus can meet that need. So I want to tell you tonight, college students, I want to ask you, for you, what does it look like? What does it look like for you? What questions do you ask out of this? How does tonight not just be a sermon, but how does tonight go into your Tuesday morning? How does this fuel your discussion after our sermon tonight? Like when you are in here and you're talking, what conversations do you have after this? Do we immediately just jump into, oh man, so how's your week? How's school going? What kind of conversations do you have right here in this room about what we've talked about tonight? What does this look like for you to change the scope of your week to live differently? What does that look like for you? I want to tell you, I wish I could cover everything tonight. I can't. But next week, we're doing our Q&A night. And you, hear me, you can send in questions about sex, about dating, or about marriage, whatever you want to send in. And next week, I'm going to answer as many questions as I can through Scripture's lens. So if you have questions, you send them to me, send them to Dakota, 901-833-7525. You can text it to my team. You can DM us on Instagram, however you want to get those questions to us. If you want to write it down and give it to us on a paper tonight, write it down, give it a paper to us tonight. I'm going to be studying this week. I'm going to come back with some scriptural answers for you next week and do as best as I can to cover all that I can. But what I want you to hear the most tonight is this. Sex, marriage, singleness are gifts. And when you understand the why of that gift, you'll always go back to giving glory to the gift giver who is God himself. 
He has a plan for you. He loves you. If you are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. None.